I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's July 27th, and we have a lot to talk about. And I'm going to start us off by talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that's MS advocacy. You know, the first thing that occurs to me when I think about advocacy is that the three things that people affected by MS care most about, access to quality health care, access to affordable prescription medications, and research that will lead to a cure, Well, all of these things are determined by and heavily dependent upon our state and federal elected officials. I guess the point I want to make here is that all three of the things that are at the top of our wish list are, at their core, legislative issues. As a district activist leader and the chair of the California Government Relations Advisory Committee for the National MS Society, I'm one of the many MS activists who recently took part in training sessions to prepare for our next round of visits with our congressional representatives. To kick off that training, we reviewed the outcome of some of our previous advocacy efforts, and I wanted to share those outcomes with you. We requested support in both the House and the Senate for $20 million in funding for fiscal year 2022 for the MS research program that's managed by the Department of Defense. Now, this is the only congressionally funded research program that is specifically for multiple sclerosis research. And today, we have 88 legislators who have signed on to the Dear Colleague letters that are circulated in the House of Representatives in support of this funding. We requested support for legislation to fund and expand telehealth, and today... The Telehealth Modernization Act has 65 co-sponsors in the House and 13 co-sponsors in the Senate. And it's worth pointing out that 53 of those 65 co-sponsors in the House of Representatives signed on to co-sponsor the bill since the MS Society's public policy conference when we made our ask of our legislators. And six of the 13 Senate co-sponsors signed on after the public policy conference. The other telehealth bill in the House, the Protecting Access to Post-COVID-19 Telehealth Act of 2021, has 45 co-sponsors, and 35 legislators joined in co-sponsoring this bill after our public policy conference when we made the ask. I know I talk a lot about the value and importance of being an MS activist, I wanted to take a moment today to share what the outcome of our advocacy looks like while legislation is still in process. And I'm looking forward to revisiting these same issues with you again once Congress votes their approval and President Biden signs them into law. But our work is far from done. New research published last week in the Journal of the American Medical Association shows that last year, collection agencies in America held $140 billion in unpaid medical bills. Now, we're not talking about money owed that's being repaid. This $140 billion is just the amount of unpaid bills that aren't being repaid. And very unscientifically, I'll say that as someone who eventually lost everything because of progressive MS, I feel pretty confident that part of that $140 billion in unpaid health care debt is a result of families living with long-term chronic illness who can no longer pay what they don't have, or at the very least, decide to pay their rent or their mortgage or buy food for one more month rather than pay the unending flood of medical bills that regularly arrive in the mail. So when it comes to advocating for access to quality, affordable health care, we still have some work ahead of us. Over the last few episodes of the podcast, we've talked about research that's shown that MS affects members of minority communities differently. And by differently, we mean worse. Higher levels of disability, shorter time to disability, and more severe MS symptoms. 
and research is also showing that many black people and people in the Latinx community aren't experiencing the same benefits from disease-modifying therapies. That's why ensuring greater diversity in clinical research is of urgent importance. At the same time, the conversation about putting the patient at the center of MS research has grown louder and more pronounced. Major pharmaceutical companies have gotten both of these messages. And joining me today to talk about bringing patient centricity and greater diversity to clinical trials is Tanya Kuiper, director in the clinical delivery unit of EMD Serono, the manufacturer of Rebif and Mavenclad. But before we get to my conversation with Tanya Kuiper, there are a few other things that you should know about. MS can be stressful, and understandably so. Symptoms like fatigue, pain, and cognitive issues, combined with the uncertainty that goes along with living with MS, well, they could all be considered stress triggers. But the other thing that research has shown is that people living with MS are incredibly resilient. So a research team in Poland wanted to better understand the specific factors that cause stress and the ways that people living with MS successfully cope with stress. They recruited 109 study participants who were all living with relapsing remitting MS. Two-thirds of this group were women, about a third were college graduates, and about a quarter of the participants indicated that they were already participating in MS support groups. The study participants were given a battery of questionnaires to complete, and these questionnaires measured their stress levels, their quality of life, their stress coping mechanisms, and they collected other information as well. The questionnaires revealed that nearly half the group reported high stress levels. 17% of the participants reported moderate stress levels, and about 35% of the participants reported low stress levels. Higher stress levels were frequently experienced by divorced or widowed patients compared with single or married patients. Study participants who were working reported lower stress levels than those participants who weren't working. And the most common stress coping strategies identified were seeking emotional support from others and active coping. Religion and substance abuse were the least used coping mechanisms. The study participants who lived with MS longer and grew older with their MS adopted positive thinking, used their sense of humor, and sought out tangible support from others as their coping strategies. Women, significantly more than men, used positive thinking and planning and turned to religion, sought out support from others, found ways to distract themselves, and seized opportunities to vent as coping strategies. And married patients were also significantly more likely to use positive thinking and seek emotional support compared to their single counterparts. The data also showed that older age correlated with a perceived lower quality of life, while employment was associated with a perceived higher quality of life. The research team concluded that quality of life in MS patients is negatively affected by a higher level of perceived stress, But the use of coping strategies like active coping, positive reframing, acceptance, and seeking emotional support was positively correlated with the quality of life of MS patients. Or, if I can put it all in a slightly different way, the study showed that people affected by MS can't control the weather, but we can learn to dance in the rain. If you'd like to review the details of this study, You'll find a link in today's show notes. Research has shown that cognitive impairment is common among people living with MS and that the worsening of cognitive function has a significant impact on a person's daily living and quality of life. Being able to track and measure changes in cognition could serve as a sort of biomarker for MS progression that could allow for targeted treatment and more timely intervention. But while cognition might be assessed during that annual or semi-annual clinic appointment, 
the monitoring of cognition is typically not part of standard care for people with MS. So a research team in the Netherlands developed a smartphone app that could provide a daily assessment of real-life cognitive functioning based on measuring information processing speed in an everyday environment. The app was installed in each study participant's phone, and participants took a 90-second smartphone-adapted symbol-digit modalities test twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. And when the researchers compared the results of the smartphone-adapted symbol-digit modalities test with the same test that's given in person in clinic, they found that the results correlated, providing evidence that cognitive function can be accurately self-assessed by people living with MS remotely and more frequently in their own real-world environment using their own smartphone. The next step may be a larger study, and then perhaps scientists will be able to conclude that changes that are recorded by a patient's smartphone can serve as a digital biomarker for MS progression. Imagine, then, if the app automatically sends an email to the patient's neurologist and a text message to the patient themselves, advising them that scheduling a visit to their MS specialist is probably a good idea. Now, that would be a useful app. If you'd like to review the details of this study, you'll find the link in today's show notes. Often when we run into a challenging situation, we might remark, or at least we hope, that there is an app for that. And frequently there is. But solving multiple sclerosis and developing new and better therapies to treat MS... Well, these are major challenges. And now, there's a supercomputer for that. Computer manufacturer NVIDIA announced the launch of the UK's most powerful supercomputer, called Cambridge One, which will use a combination of artificial intelligence and simulation to better understand complex diseases like MS and to design new therapeutics. The Cambridge One supercomputer is ranked among the 50 fastest computers in the world. It's powered by renewable energy. And to express the power of this supercomputer in a way that only a serious geek could truly appreciate, Cambridge One delivers more than 400 petaflops of artificial intelligence performance. And if you're wondering how fast and powerful 400 petaflops are, please consider that one petaflop is equal to 1,000 trillion computing operations per second. When you have a problem to solve, it's great to find that there's an app for that. And when you have a complex problem to solve, it's really good to have one of the fastest supercomputers on Earth working on it. We'll be sure to keep you updated on the progress that Cambridge One makes And when you realize that in the time that it's taken me to tell you about Cambridge One, it's already completed 40 million trillion computing operations, well, Cambridge One, if you're listening, we're expecting great things. We're also expecting that MS disease-modifying therapies work pretty much the same across the board, but we're discovering that's not always the case. Research has shown that compared to white people living with MS, members of minority communities don't always gain the same benefits from a disease-modifying therapy. And that's why it's so vitally important to find ways to create greater diversity in clinical research. My guest today is Tanya Kuiper, director in the clinical delivery unit at VMD Serono, the pharmaceutical company that produces Rebif and Mavenclad for people living with MS. In a moment, we'll meet my guest, Tanya Kuiper. Over the past couple of years, the conversation about putting the patient at the center of MS research has grown louder and more pronounced. At the same time, the need for greater diversity in clinical trials has become much more than just a conversation with some research showing that MS affects members of minority communities differently 
the need for greater diversity in clinical trials is urgent. With me to talk about what happens when a company puts these kinds of conversations into action is Tanya Kuiper, representing EMD Serono as director in the clinical delivery unit, where she leads efforts at EMD Serono to bring patient centricity to clinical studies. Welcome to the podcast, Tanya. Thanks so much, John, for the invitation. I'm very happy being here and um, yeah, talking about this very important topic, of course. Why is this work of bringing greater diversity and inclusion to clinical studies so important? Um, actually, to me, it is so important because all our um, assets, all our compounds, all our drugs that we are developing are for patients. And uh, of course, for all the patients who are actually suffering uh, from the respective disease. So therefore, it is uh, in all of our interest to have in our clinical trials also those patients represented who are ultimately uh, in need of this specific drug and who are suffering from the specific disease. And um, this is actually the overall topic of diversity and inclusion, to um, represent all those patient populations who are actually affected by a specific disease also in our clinical trials. And um, yeah, and, and unfortunately, I have to say, this is still a topic that uh, we need to heavily work on because diversity and inclusion or minority populations are still underrepresented in our clinical trials. And this is obviously something that we have to change and that we have to work on. And we are working on that already, but still, uh, it's a way to go. So tell me, how is EMD Serono addressing the challenge of ensuring diversity and inclusion in clinical trials? Yeah, actually from um, different angles. So um, the FDA and pharma have worked um, in 2020 and released in 2020 important um, works about um, inclusion of minority populations or in general about diversity and inclusion in clinical trials. And we have, of course, reviewed um, all this important work and have tried to um, identify actions, how we can realize um, these requirements in our studies. And um, this is, of course, one thing to, to be close to the, uh, the recommendations and also um, the advices uh, from, from very important stakeholders in our um, pharmaceutical environment, including FDA, of course, and including pharma. But in addition, we are also looking into um, the opportunity to directly work with minority patients when we are talking and discussing ways on how to include patients in our study. So we, we are going into the dialogue or we are opening um, the dialogue with um, minority representatives to bet, get a better understanding what can we change in a, for a better representation in our clinical trials for example, done in our patient advisory board meetings as one topic, and we will come to that later when we are talking about patient centricity in general. But I think communication is one important topic. Another one is also to understand the hurdles, why patients are not interested potentially to participate in clinical trials, and also um, to find or to cooperate um, with clinical trial sites who have um, a better representation of a diverse physician community as well, because we understand that uh, the selection of clinical trial site has an important role to play in this context. And we are following that path and we are going this direction. So there are lots of activities, just a few of those that I just mentioned. But I think um, having the opportunity to directly interact with patients and to understand their needs is a very essential portion of things also in this context. A company can say they're committed to broadening engagement with underserved communities and creating greater diversity in clinical trials, but actually doing the work and getting it done can sometimes be more challenging. You just mentioned one of the keys is understanding the hurdles that stand in the way, the obstacles that prevent that kind of greater inclusion. So what are some of the challenges that face EMD Serono or really any pharmaceutical company when you make mm. this sort of commitment? Yeah, I think that there is always, when we are talking about clinical trials, the portion of trust that 
This is linked, of course, to um, the overall awareness of what clinical trials are about and that we often get feedback like um, that you are a guinea pig when you are participating in a clinical trial, which, of course, is not the case, right? But there is still a sort of perception which is linked to missing trust. Um, so missing understanding, missing trust, and um, maybe missing communication and missing communication channels in the respective communities is what we need to what we need to work on, and uh, which I think um, are very relevant points when it comes to reaching out to patients, regardless of whether these patients are minority patients or representing minority populations or not. Uh, this is a general topic, and we really need to take that. We really need to take that seriously. But we need to also understand that not each and every patient has the the same hurdles and the same difficulties and has the same needs. And this is what we need to and must work on to really understand the individual different hurdles, identify those, and work together with patients to reduce the barriers. Tanya, what does patient centricity mean to EMD Serona? Patient centricity actually means for us at EMD Serona, but also personally for me, it is um, a topic that I'm very passionate about in my daily work, uh, is actually that we are working together with patients for patients to develop drugs um, together with patients in the best way we can. And um, patient centricity is also to listen to patients, taking the time, getting into dialogue or into communication with patients to understand their needs, to understand their problems, issues, what they need when it comes to clinical trials, but of course also to get an understanding what are the unmet medical needs that we have to work on as a pharmaceutical company. And we are doing this in, in various ways at EMD. Um, so for example, one of the cornerstones of our patient-centric activities actually are patient advice report meetings, where we are sitting together with patients to discuss the clinical trial designs in the setup phase of our studies. And this is actually a real eye-opener. I have been doing this since, since years already. I have been participating in some of patient advice report meetings, but it is also very, it's always very, um, how to say, moving to see um, how patients look are looking into things completely differently sometimes than we thought or we designed things. We had the opinion to do this in the best interest of patients. That was where we are coming from, of course. And we felt like we had found the best way. And then we are discussing this with patients and patients have a different opinion. And this is so helpful. And this is so important for us because this opens us a different angle to perceive how patients would want to participate in a clinical trial. So patient advice report meetings, is one, is one of those or are one of those things that are very important. But we are also doing um, in interactions with patients who are participating directly in our studies. So patient advisory board meetings are, as I said before, done previously with patients who are not participating in our study. But we are also asking the patients who are participating in our study um, for their feedback on um, the study itself that they are currently joining. And this is, of course, also an additional very helpful tool because it gives us direct information from our study participants on the study that those patients are joining with us. But there are also other things. So in addition to this, we, uh, we have been doing patient journey maps. We have been doing uh, trial simulations. These are all very effective methods to, to get a closer and a better understanding of patients' needs and opinions. We have been talking with patients in patient advisory board meetings um, for our MS studies, of course, as well. And I wanted to mention that um, also to our MS patients who are listening in here. So we are currently conducting uh, two phase three studies where um, the patient's voice was very, very important for us because um, we had started to think about um, the patient's recommendations or patient's views very early on in our clinical trial design. And um, some of those recommendations that patients had shared with us during those patient advice report meetings could directly be implemented in our clinical trials. So, for example, to make, to make it easier for patients to, to join our studies, to, to stay in our studies, in general, to reduce the patient burden in our clinical trials. 
And if you're interested to learn more about those studies, um, you can go into the evolutionstudies.com homepage. Um, it's a website where you can find more information about what these studies are about. Uh, we are still recruiting patients um, also in the US and Canada. And if you're interested in finding out more, go to www.evolutionstudies.com uh, for more information on this specific clinical trial. Well, I'll be sure to include a link to that site in today's show notes. So it sounds like when you are interacting with patients, when you're having these conversations, you're not merely collecting feedback, but some of that feedback gets put into action and gets integrated into the study design. This is actually the reason why we're doing this, right? Um, all these, these interactions with patients is to learn from patients, to understand better, and to directly transfer it into our clinical trial design or into our, um, how to say, efforts to, to, develop, new, to, to develop new drugs. Um, we can, of course, not, how to say, take all the considerations directly into action because sometimes um, the recommendations would potentially jeopardize the overall scientific remit. So we need to be very careful in that. But those things that can be really integrated into our design are integrated. And uh, specifically, when we are talking about the patient burden, this is something that we take very seriously. So I, I, I'm really proud and happy that we were able to, to listen to our patients and really um, um, get a much better understanding on how to come up with better clinical trials through this dialogue. Tanya Kuiper, when I introduced you, I said that there's been lots of conversation about the need for deeper patient engagement and greater diversity in clinical research. Thank you for showing us what that looks like when a company synthesizes those conversations into action. And thanks for talking with me today. Thanks so much, John. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 204. You'll find that link in today's show notes so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or a text. If you haven't yet done so, please don't forget to visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the easiest way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes, and it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. So I hope you'll take a moment and download the app today. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.